are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon. I am Ellen Safely from the University of Texas at Dallas Libraries. I'm here today to introduce this session and our speaker. Today's seminar or webinar is You Want Me to Select for What? Getting Started in a New Area. This program is brought to you by ALEX, the Association for Collections and Technical Services Division of the American Library Association. The Continuing Education Committee of ALEX is providing learning opportunities for those who work in library service. Today's presenter is Virginia Kay, or Ginger, Ginger Williams. She has experience as a school librarian, a school district administrator, and as a selector. Ginger is the head of acquisitions at Wichita State University. Currently, she selects in engineering and law, and previously she worked at Mississippi State University. Ginger holds a bachelor's degree in history from Furman University, a master's in library science, and a specialist degree in library science with concentrations in collections and technical services, and a law degree from the University of South Carolina. Ginger is past chair of the ELEX Collection Management and Development Sections Education Committee and is vice chair, chair elect of the Collection Management and Development Section. So the technology you're using today will allow you to send messages to Ginger. She will answer them as time permits. So if the technology is working, let's get start started. Hello, Ginger. Thanks, Ellen. Hmm. Thanks, Ellen. Let's see if I can manage to figure out how to get this technology to switch to the screens to slideshow. Can you all see this? Well, yeah, have you ever noticed how scary a new collection development assignment is? If you're a brand new librarian who knows lots about the subject, like I know a lot about law, you realize that selecting hundreds of books for other people isn't quite as easy as selecting a dozen books for yourself. If you're an experienced librarian who's moved to a new library, you may even know the subject, but you don't know the local interests. Or you may be just like I was at my first university job and think, but what's the difference between mechanical engineering and industrial engineering anyway? I don't know anything about that. Fortunately, I'm a librarian and so are you. Just think of your new selection assignment as a research project. Research projects start with questions. Today, we're going to be looking at some strategies to help you figure out what your new subject includes, what people in your community need, and how you can identify new materials for your subject. Oh, by the way, you don't need to frantically scribble notes. The ELEX office will send you a recording of this webinar, along with an evaluation survey, in a few days. And at the end of the webinar, I'll give you a few minutes to ask questions. I just hope I know the answers. So, when I get started with a new subject assignment, I begin by checking for existing information that might be helpful. These are some of the things I look for. I look for collection development policies. Every library should have a general collection development policy. That policy may include, if you're lucky, some background on the, inf on the community that you serve, the library's goals, and guidelines on things like with their textbooks should be added to the collection. For some reason, that seems to show up, the textbook issue, in every general collection development policy I've ever read. The library may even have subject-specific collection policies. We'll look at some examples of those later. Ask if your library has done any collection assessments or user surveys in the last two or three years. If they have, get copies and skim them. When I started my first high school library job, I found a survey of reading interests that my predecessor had done a year earlier. I wasn't surprised to see that lots of high school students were interested in sports. But I was surprised at some of the sports that they mentioned in the comment sections. When I think of sports, I think about football, basketball, and baseball, the things my dad watched on television. But my students were interested in golf, karate, volleyball, weightlifting, wrestling, and all sorts of other things that just never crossed my mind. So do check the comments. Then ask your acquisition staff, or if you're the only person, check your files, 
about materials the library receives automatically. You may have standing orders for award-winning books, for bestsellers, series, or even everything from a certain publisher. You don't want to accidentally order duplicates. It's okay to order duplicates on purpose unless your library says not to, but don't do it by accident. Also, make a note now on your calendar to go back in about six months to review the titles that you're receiving on standing order. Publishers and series change over time. Our new business selector recently commented that the American Management Association standing order had lots of popular titles that she didn't really think were appropriate for our library. But when we went back and looked, the things that they were publishing five years ago were much more scholarly. So do make a note to check those standing orders. Ask, too, if your library has an approval plan. With an approval plan, someone went through and identified subjects that were of interest to your library. They can be very detailed. Your library may be getting approval book shipments, or they may be getting new book notifications. Um, the subjects in your approval profile will guide which books come in or which new book notifications you get. A carefully written, up-to-date approval profile is a great source of information about major concepts in your subject. You do need to be a little cautious about relying on the profile completely, because an old profile may not reflect changing needs in the community, it may not reflect new developments in the subject, and you may just not have a complete profile on purpose. We don't have a complete profile at Wichita State for music because we get some of our, so much of our music stuff doesn't come through our major vendor. So we deliberately don't have everything coming through them. Um, check for the approval profile, use it, but keep in mind that updating that profile is the selector's responsibility. If it hasn't been updated lately, you may need to do it in a year or so after you get familiar with the subject. By the way, while you're asking for information, ask if it's possible to get reports on circulation, usage, interlibrary loan requests, and missing books. We'll talk about what to do with those in a little bit. Now, as you're reviewing some of this background information you found, think about your library's goals. Does your library focus on supporting curriculum and teaching in a college? Maybe you're a public library that focuses on promoting literacy and meeting personal information needs for all ages. Or you could be in a library where you're supporting the professional and continuing, conti gosh, let me start that one over again, where you're supporting the professional and continuing education needs of business people. Let me give you an example of why that's important. Suppose you're selecting legal materials for your library, like I did for mine. Last month, I was very tempted to order a fascinating book about how the rule against perpetuities interacts with modern reproductive and life extension therapies. It's a scholarly book on a legal theory that really interests me and has for years. Would you select that book for your library? If you're in a public library, you probably do need some legal materials, but they're going to be materials aimed at a general audience, like books about handling disputes with your landlord. You may even need some professional books written for a business audience if you cater to the business community. And you might want standing orders to state statutes and legal cases for your state if you're large enough to be able to afford them. Yeah, that scholarly book of mine about the rule against perpetuities isn't appropriate for most public libraries. It's not appropriate for lots of academic libraries either. A community college library probably focuses on curriculum support with books aimed at legal issues for business people and maybe for a paralegal program. They probably don't want a lot of scholarly research. The Urban, Univer the Urban Research Library, where I work, needs materials to support the curriculum. But most of what I select in are books about legal issues for musicians and nurses and other students and majors that we have. I select some books on intellectual property issues that our researchers face, things like patent law. But we don't have a law program 
so we don't really need that fascinating book on legal theory. It's really only appropriate for a law school library, so unfortunately I had to put that one aside. When you start a new subject assignment, do take a minute to think about your library's goals. They're critically important in how you approach the subject. Then think about the characteristics of your library's users, too. If you're in a public library, you can search the Census Bureau website by zip code or city to answer many questions. Are you serving a highly educated middle class community? They'll have different needs than a core community with lots and lots of people who haven't finished high school. What languages do the people in your community speak and read? Do you have a high proportion of senior citizens? If you do, you may have a few different needs than a, co a community with lots of young families. Hmm. Does your library serve an urban or rural population? People who live in cities and people who live in the country tend to have different interests. Check other resources too, like the Chamber of Commerce, phone book, and the local paper. Those can answer questions like, what are the major industries in your community? And what recreational opportunities are available? If you're in an academic setting, you may find the Census Bureau information useful, but you need to check the college website, the catalog, and the recruiting materials for other information. Do you serve primarily full-time, traditional college-age students, or does your college enroll many working adults who attend classes part-time? Do you have undergraduate or graduate students? What majors are they taking? Do you have many students in basic skills development programs? If so, you're probably going to need some materials that are a little easier to read than most of the scholarly texts that typically are bought in, in large uni research universities. Are your faculty primarily focused on teaching, like most community college faculty are? Or do they have a very strong research agenda, like most of the faculty at my university have? Do you support special programs, like a small business development center or patent depository that tend to bring in community users that you need to support? Remember, you're not just selecting materials about a subject. You're selecting materials for people to use. Take time to learn a little bit about the groups that you serve. Then let's think about what we already have and how it's used. If you were able to get some usage reports, you can find some valuable clues to what people find useful and interesting. Ask for a year's worth of circulation statistics broken down by classification numbers. Then compare those classification numbers to the subjects um, in whatever classification scheme your library uses. Ask about in-house use statistics too. Many people use materials in the library instead of checking them out, so you don't get a complete picture without the in-house use statistics. Look at the statistic, statistics. Can you identify the classifications people use the most and the least? If you're fortunate, your integrated library system will produce a report showing titles that have circulated heavily. Ask about getting a report that shows maybe the top 25 items that are used most in the collection areas for your subject. I did that recently, and I discovered that almost 70% of those top 25 books in our material science collection had the word composites in the title. That's a pretty clear indicator that I need to make sure we have a strong collection on composites. Now, when you're looking at that list of little used areas in your subject, don't automatically decide not to buy much in those areas. Take a few minutes to go look at the shelves. People tend to use attractive materials and avoid ugly ones. Are the materials that are rarely used old, faded, and worn compared to materials that are heavily used? If they are, you should probably consider updating that part of your collection a little bit. Then, look for information about unmet needs. My library has an interlibrary loan program, and I've been able to get lists of titles borrowed on interlibrary loan during the last year. It's amazing when I go through that list 
I will see the same titles of the same topics borrowed over and over again. Those are topics that I need to add more materials on. I also skim through the list of missing book report of missing books every year. If we keep getting reports of the same types of books going missing over and over again, like I keep getting reports of all the Microsoft Office books going missing, we need to buy more material on that subject. People definitely need it. So look through those reports for repeated requests on the same topic. There are lots of other ways you can learn about what people want. Most people think about surveys and interviews as ways to learn about what people want. But those take lots of time and they require you know a little bit about the subject in order to be able to construct a good survey or do a good interview. So I recommend that you start by reviewing existing data like your usage reports. Okay, you've tracked down existing information like collection development policies. You've identified the primary goals of the collection, whether it's curriculum support or meeting popular information needs. And you figured out who uses the collection and started looking at what they use and what they ask for that you don't have. It's time to figure out your new subject. When I started my first academic library job at Mississippi State, after many years' experience as a school librarian, I was assigned collection development in mechanical engineering and industrial engineering. I literally did not know the difference between those two subjects. As a matter of fact, I had no clue why we would need eight different departments for engineering. After all, what do engineers do anyway? Build bridges, right? Yeah. So, I had to start from scratch. My first step was grabbing a sheet of paper, jotting the subjects across the top, and then going out to research the major concepts for each subject. My original list wasn't nearly as tidy as the one you're seeing on the screen now, but I did find, I have found that that list of major concepts is helpful. And I still do one for every subject I'm assigned. I use it too. When I'm selecting, I pull a copy of the list out and put it in front of me. When I'm selecting, I put a tally mark beside the major concept for every book I request. I'm not trying to select the same number of books on every topic. We need more materials in some topics, like composites. And besides, the number of books published on each topic varies from year to year. But the tally marks do let me see very quickly if I'm favoring some concepts and neglecting others. Hmm. If you like the idea of a major concept list or any other kind of chart that you do, how do you figure out what the major concepts for your subject are? Your sources are going to vary depending on the kind of library you work in and what's available. But we're going to look a little bit at some possibilities. I mentioned earlier that some libraries have subject-specific collection development policies. I want to look at two examples, the collection policies for sports in a public library and an academic library. Now, give me a second to see if I can manage to figure out how to switch my screen around. Mm, come on, thing. Okay. Here we go. This is the collection development policy for a rural public library system in Wyoming. Sports is in the nonfiction section down in the 790s under Arts and Recreation. There we are. So I'm going to try to scroll down slowly and see what kinds of major concepts I can find for my list. Well, let me see. Outdoor sports, aquatic and air sports, oh, swimming things, equestrian sports. All right. Hmm. We're also mentioning things like rules and techniques. I hadn't thought about wanting to buy rule books for sports, but yeah, that makes sense. And then here's an example of how your library setting influences selection. I bet, this I bet if you're in a library of Florida, 
you're not going to include ice hockey as one of the major areas of emphasis in your sports collection. But in Wyoming, it makes sense. Now, let's compare that to the collection development policy for kinesiology and sports studies at Wichita State University, where I work. This policy begins with information about the curriculum and co collecting goals. I'm going to scroll down to the fourth page so we can look at some, look for some major concepts. Try not to scroll slowly enough that I don't make you too dizzy. I've been told that's one of my bad habits. Okay, here we go. Hmm, this is a lot different from the list for that public library in Wyoming, isn't it? We're talking about equity issues in athletics and kinesiology and anaerobic exercise, muscle strength and endurance. Much different. And look, down here under sports excluded, subjects ex excluded, we are specifically excluding material and popular sports topics and sports figures. Why? because we're an academic library and our primary job is supporting the curriculum. Hmm. See why I said you need to start by figuring out who you serve? Okay, let's go back over to that PowerPoint. And remember these CD policies are in the list that you're, will be on the recording that you'll get from Julie a little bit later. Now, not all libraries have subject-specific CD policies. They take a lot of time to develop. They need regular updating. Some libraries just don't spend the time doing that. And I can't blame them. If you have 16 things to do during the day, this may or may not be your top priority. But subject-specific CD policies are invaluable sources for new selectors. If your library doesn't have subject subject-specific policies, consider looking at some for other libraries. They can suggest concepts you should consider. They can also suggest issues that you might want to think about. Like, hmm, well, do we need to get sports biographies as well as books about rules and techniques? Or, wow, never thought about exercise science being part of sports, but maybe it is. Don't copy other libraries' policies blindly. Your selections need to meet your community's needs, not the needs of some other community. Okay, another way to identify major concepts is to look at a classification schedule. This is the, the classification schedule from the Library of Congress system for sports and recreation. Now, both the Dewey and the Library of Congress classification outlines are available online, and they are free. Just go in and do a, a quick search for them. And both of them are useful because they're organized differently, so they're useful for different reasons. Even as a school librarian, though, I use, I use the LC schedule a lot as a source for subject concepts because it's so detailed. Just looking through it gives me ideas about things I might or might not want to include. Okay, these are just a few examples of some bibliographies and guides to the literature. You can find them in catalogs from library science publishers like ALA, Neil Schumann, and Scarecrow Press. You can also find them by searching WorldCat with phrases like business libraries collection development, engineering bibliography, or public libraries, United States book lists. Actually, what I searched for was public libraries book lists. The subject just happened to have United States in it. Now, a current guide, like the Southern Selectors Guide to Business Resources, is best for learning major concepts. Unfortunately, you may not be able to find one. But you know, older guides can be useful too. For example, when I started selecting engineering, engineering materials, I found a 20-year-old guide to research in engineering. Remember, I didn't know anything about engineering then. Those sources were outdated, but I did find some terms to add to my major concepts list. 
And that old guide made me aware that technical papers, conference proceedings, and standards are critical to engineers. If I hadn't looked at that guide, I would have been buying just regular old books. That old guide also had a list of professional organizations, many of which still exist and many of which publish critical resources. And when I scanned the citations, I was able to identify some of the major publishers. Then I went over and checked their websites to see what kinds of things they were publishing. You need to use old guides cautiously, but they can be useful. Look, though, first for a current guide. The more current, the more useful. Then you have things like general guides. Wilson's Public Library Core Collection is one that I've used in the past. It can be helpful when, those can be helpful when you're learning the subject because they suggest the range of materials available. You're not necessarily looking for specific titles. You're looking for major concepts you want to include. They can also be a good way to identify the major publishers for a subject. Okay, some other sources for subject concepts. If you're an academic librarian, check the college catalog for course descriptions. A lot of those major concepts of in, in engineering, I came up with by going through the course descriptions and looking for unfamiliar words. Check the department website too. You may be lucky enough to find that some syllabi are available online. If so, they'll outline the major concepts that you need to be purchasing in. If you're in a research university, look for descriptions of research centers and faculty research interests on department websites. School and public librarians that serve home school, school librarians and public librarians that serve home school populations may find curriculum guides from their State Department of Education or their local school district useful, particularly in identifying subjects for the children's nonfiction collection. After all, if those third graders are all studying American Indians, you probably are going to have a lot of interest in American Indians from that age group. You know, another option is to skim the table of contents for an introductory textbook in your subject, or the headings in encyclopedia articles about your subject, or the contents for a year's worth of magazine issues. Just skimming headings can help you figure out major concepts. I'm not suggesting you read them from cover to cover. You can if you want to, and if you have unlimited time. But remember, your goal at this point is to figure out the major concepts Figure out how that subject's organized and learn what the current hot topics are. Your major concept list is a starting point. It's not everything you need to know about your new subject. You need to plan to keep learning as long as you select. And there are lots of ways to learn, but some of them take time. Once you get a little bit of knowledge about your new subject, you can start talking to people who are using the materials in that subject. One of the best learning experiences I've had recently was spending a day at our student research fair talking with students about the research they were presenting. I learned a lot about what they were interested in, what kinds of things were going on on my campus that weren't available from published sources, and what they had trouble finding in the library. I also started getting requests from people for more materials on particular topics in engineering because they learned who to ask. So, look for opportunities to connect with the people who use the materials you select. Okay, you've tracked down existing information like collection development policies. You've identified the primary goals of the collection. You've even figured out who uses the collection. And now, you've identified the major concepts for your subject. But where do you find new materials for the library? Well, the obvious place to start, the one that probably every one of us heard about in library school, was review journals. Um, book list for public libraries, choice for academic libraries, 
School Library Journal for Children's Materials are all good sources. Whether you have them in paper or online, you'll find review journals important in most subjects. Do check to see if you happen to have the major review journal for your library in an online version. Wichita State has the online version of choice. And I've gone in and saved searches for all the subjects I select for. Every month I go back to, that, to choice online. I run the search and I say what's been recommended for this month. It's a quick, easy way to check the reviews without having to read the journal from cover to cover or even just to read the entire section from my area. Check on what your library has because there's dozens of other good review journals. Not everybody is lucky enough to have a, a, select, a good selection of review journals. But many of us have access to an online magazine collection. You know, lots of states seem to be providing those these days for all libraries. So check to see what you have in an online magazine collection if you don't have review journals. For example, I use Gail's Academic ASAP, which we have here, to skim through review to skim through reviews. I can go to the advanced search, limit myself to articles from book list for a specific month, like October of 2009, and then enter a keyword search, book review, to retrieve all of the reviews published in that particular month. Now, I admit, it's a lot easier for me to skim the paper copy, but we have a dozen librarians who pass book list around and it doesn't always get to me quite as quickly as I want. So sometimes I go in and search online. If you don't have access to review journals, or if you don't have all the journals you'd like to have, experiment with any online magazine collections you have to see what kinds of book reviews you can get from them. Like I said, I can get everything published in book list from ours. Book reviews are an obvious starting point, but about half the books published in the United States never get reviewed. Many others don't get reviewed for months or even years after publication. So you're going to need to look for other sources too. As you might expect, the publishing and library vendor industries produce many useful sources. After all, their job is to sell us books. Most of us are familiar with the New York Times bestseller lists, but other groups produce bestseller lists too. I went to the ubiquitous Google and did a search for religious bestsellers last week and found out that the Christian Booksellers Association, which I'd never heard of before, produces a bestseller list. Now, it's not something that I need since I select for engineering and law, but if you happen to be selecting for religion in an academic library, or if you're selecting for um, a fiction collection or, not, or religion in a public library, you might like to know about the Christian Bookseller Association's bestseller list. Hmm. Try other combinations to see what kinds of bestseller lists you can find. I've also mentioned some ways to to identify major publisher, publishers for your subject. Since so many books don't get reviewed, you are going to sometimes probably need to rely on publisher catalogs and websites. Identifying those major publishers tells you where to look. Keep in mind, the major publisher for your subject isn't necessarily a really large publisher. For aerospace engineering, I do a lot with professional association publications. They're not very big publishers, but they do publish in my area. If I were doing, um, if I were developing a popular collection on organic gardening and fitness, I'd probably want to order materials from Rodale Press. They're not large, but they do publish lots of popular materials in organic gardening and fitness. So do do take time to identify the major publishers and go look directly at their material. And if you ever, ever give them an email address for you 
or a mailing address, you'll start getting their catalogs. By the way, if you're in an academic library, they're also probably sending those catalogs to the, directly to faculty. So you may start getting catalog pages torn out of the catalogs you know, by the faculty and sent to you. Next, check to see what kinds of lists your vendors offer. I've got a couple of examples here. The first one is from my library's primary vendor, Blackwell. They're an academic book vendor. They produce a monthly list of recommended titles in various subject areas. This month is something about environmental resources. I haven't looked at a whole lot because it's not an area that I select for. But I found in the past when they've had technology lists that those can be very useful. Another example is from Baker and Taylor. Baker and Taylor produces a monthly list of recommended music recordings. It's called the CD Hot List. Both of those lists are available free to anybody on the web. And both of them are done by librarians who are employed by vendors or who volunteer to, with vendors. They're useful. So look around to see what your vendor offers. And keep in mind that while some of the some things like the two I've mentioned are available free to anybody on the web, some vendors also produce lists that only customers can access. It may be worthwhile to look on their website or to ask the vendor representative what kinds of lists they produce. And earlier I mentioned approval plans. Remember that approval plan is designed around a subject profile that you or another librarian developed. If your library has an approval plan that includes notifications of new books, use it. Just don't do like I do. I have a tendency to let my new book notifications pile up until I have hundreds to go through at the same time. I keep promising I will do better. Think about best book lists. Now, the disadvantage to best book lists is that they're including books that have been published for a while. And you may be trying to collect brand new things. But they're also a good way to check for things that you missed. And no matter how good you are as a selector, you will miss some things occasionally. There's a wide variety of best book lists. Um, this is a few examples. Resource for College Libraries is a fairly new database. It is exactly what it says it is. It's highly recommended books for college libraries. It's a subscription product. It's not free. Um, I went in and looked in WorldCat to see what kinds of best book lists I could find. And one of the examples I found that looked interesting, and we happen to have it in our collection, is the Essential Guide to Spanish Reading. It's a book. It's only two or three years old. And given that we seem to have a growing um, Spanish collection in the area, I think it might be time for us to start looking at that. And then there's Doty's Core Titles in the Health Sciences. This is an unusual one. It's an annual list. It started off years ago with a couple of librarians in the health sciences who were doing this as a professional service. And now it's turned into a business deal because after they retired, they decided not to continue with it. If you're in a health science library, academic, medical school, whatever, you probably are familiar with DOTIs. And if you're not familiar with it, you need to get familiar with it. Now, as it happens, DOTIs is the one that I found in an interesting way. I saw it mentioned on a list serve. We're service people. As librarians, most of us love to help other people. If you're starting in a brand new area, one of the best things you can do for yourself is to email a quick question to whatever list serves your own and ask. Be, sim be simple about it. Hey, I am just got assigned to do collection development for engineering, and I have no idea where to start. Are there any best book lists or other resources that you can suggest? Offer to, remember to offer to compile a list for the, to send back to everybody else. You're not the only one who has that question. 
a few other sources, award lists. You probably are already aware of this, but any time a book, a film, a music recording wins an award, people are going to start asking for that title. Watch American Libraries, College Research and Research Library News, and other professional journals that you're reading for announcements of awards. Um, Listservs also frequently include award announcements, and so do library blocks. Now, most people when they think about awards think things like National Book Awards, the Pulitzer Prize, maybe the um, Caldecott Medal, but there are lots of specialty awards too. There's the Dartmouth Medal for, hmm, reference I believe, and there's one that I look for every year. The American Association for Engineering Education gives an annual award for the best reference source in engineering. And I found out about that from an engineering librarian's listserv that I joined because I had no clue what I was doing. Now, while we're on the topic of materials people ask for, consider monitoring media sources, everything from radios to blogs. A public librarian suggested this one to me, earlyword.com. It's a great little blog that tries to identify things that are going to be popular, that are going to be in demand. Even though we're a university library and we primarily focus on curriculum support, we do have a leisure reading collection and we have a juvenile literature collection to support the teacher education program. I find that earlyworld.com is a good place to find books for those two collections. And remember to look for reviews and advertisements in the media. Believe it or not, every month I go out and pick up several of the professional magazines for engineers that we subscribe to, and I scan through them. The main thing I'm looking for then is publisher advertisements, especially those big full page ones that you see sometimes. Because the engineering faculty and students also read those journals, and they come in and ask for things that they've seen advertised. Finally, remember, patrons do make requests. So, what kinds of things are your patrons asking for? Are you going to buy them? If you're going to buy, if you buy some things that patrons request, and most of us do, you need to figure out how to respond back to patrons who ask for things that just aren't appropriate. They will do it. You do need to have a response ready. Don't ignore your patron requests. They can be a really valuable source of information. Hmm. So let's go back and review that. Remember, getting started in a new subject area is just a research project. You're a librarian. You know how to do research. These are some of the questions you need to be looking for. Who is going to use these materials? What are they using them for? Are they using this stuff as part of doing research for courses they're taking here on campus? Are they business people in the community who are using the public library, its business collection? Are they local inventors and they're looking for information about what to do with their new invention, how to patent it and make money off of it? Are they parents? looking for information about how to manage that child that's causing a few too many problems. Who are these people and what are they looking for? Because you're not selecting for a subject, you're selecting for people interested in a subject. Then look at what you already have. What's being used? What's not being used? What do people want that you don't have? And take a few minutes to think about, as you get more familiar with this subject and have time, people who your library is supposed to serve who aren't coming in your door. Are they not coming in because you don't have what they want? Maybe you need to spend a little time looking for some, some things that you don't have. Take time to make a list of the major concepts in your subject. Figure out how your subject is organized and what words 
are related to your subject. That list is going to vary depending on where you are. But it's a great way to get started if you are brand new and you really have no idea what you're doing. That major concept list is also useful for helping you stay on track when you're buying in an area that you are familiar with, an area that you really love, and you're worried about spending too much money on the things you like instead of spending money on the things that other people want. That's an er a mistake that I've seen lots of librarians make. Okay, I know all about English. I have a PhD in English. And then they start doing collection development and they realize after a little while that they've really bought way too much stuff on 20th century American poetry, which is their specialty. And they've kind of neglected the rest of the English um, collection. So, what are the major concepts in your subject? And then think about how am I going to find new materials? Who are the major publishers for my subject? What kinds of resources can I look at to find suggestions for titles? And keep in mind that you will be learning as long as you select. Every good librarian learns during their entire career. Don't be an exception to that. Now, do you have any questions? I finished faster than I expected to, so we do have some time for some. If you've got questions, please go ahead and type those in now. I'm going to try to respond to as many as I can. If you have more questions than I can respond to in the time we have available, um, then I will send those answers to Julie later so she can send them out with the presentation. Or I'll email you directly if it's something that's very specific to your field. Okay, we seem to be having a small technical difficulty called I can't see the question panel on my screen. I'm in the chat box right now, so I'm going to see what I can find in that and hope that um, my technical support back up. Ginger, this is Pamela. Um, I'll read the question for you if you can answer. Can you hear me? Hmm. All right. First question I'm seeing is, do you know where I could find a list of a list of listservs for academic librarians collecting in different areas? Um, well, the first place I'm going to look, go for that is actually going to be the American Library Association website, College and Research Libraries, and go over and take a look at the listservs available there. I'll see if I can find a list there because I know I've seen one before. But I know, for example, that one of my colleagues is a member of the of a section that's involved in social studies and another is a member of the section involved in education. And I'd be willing to bet that they have list serves for those areas. Um, I've also got a colleague that's a member of the Special Libraries Association Science and Technology section and who finds their list serve very helpful. Hmm. Do you think there's a difference between developing an online versus a print collection? Well, yes and no. 
you still need to know what your users want and need. You still need to know what kinds of things they are using and what kinds of things they're asking for that you don't have. You still need to know something about your subject. The biggest difference between an online collection and the print collection is that there are different methods of getting the materials and with the online collection you have to think about format issues. Um, do your users have access, high speed access, so that they can actually, so they can use the online materials? Everywhere I've worked recently has had users with that kind of access, but I've talked with people who work in smaller colleges, who work in areas with high poverty, who work in rural areas where access is an issue for them. The other big difference is online collections, lots of times instead of doing title by title selection, you're selecting an entire group of materials put together by a particular provider. So there are some differences, but critical things are still there. What do your users want and need? What are the main topics in this subject? What's not being done? Hmm. Okay, Scott in Texas, how often do you pick out selections? Well, let me give you the ideal answer and then the real answer. Ideally, with a budget of about $20,000 to pick engineering and law materials for my university, I would be going through my selection, my book slips, and looking through catalogs and things at least twice a month. Actually, what tends to happen is I get really busy working on projects for acquisitions and I sort of let collection development slide. And then I have to spend a couple of days, a weekend, and go through and catch up. Fortunately for me, I just met the deadline for spending, for getting 50% of my money encumbered. Hmm. Okay, next one. Is it important to have faculty input in the development of a collection development policy for an academic library? Well, yes and no. If you're talking about a general collection development policy, you're going to be focusing on some important principles. Um, freedom of information. Who do, we, who do we actually serve? You're also going to be focusing on some things like, are we, as an academic library, primarily responsible for providing supplemental materials to support the curriculum, materials to support research policies, or are we going to also collect things like textbooks that, um, that are assigned for students? Those things don't need as much faculty input, although it's help, it certainly helps the faculty understand the policy and support it. The subject policies, though, if you're, act, if you're going to develop a subject-specific policy, you need to understand what the faculty want and what the students want very well. If you're not asking for faculty input and, faculty inform and information from the faculty about what kinds of topics are important, you may not understand as much as you should. I have worked in a library where most of the selection was being done by the faculty and the librarians only selected if the faculty didn't turn in requests. Sometimes you have to do it that way. Sometimes that works best from a political standpoint. Sometimes it's a matter of you don't have time. But faculty sometimes forget that they need to meet student needs too and that students don't know everything they know. That students don't have access to the same resources. So try to keep at least some of the budget back for your own selection. Hmm. Okay, another question. Do you have other recommended ways to find key publishers in your areas? All right. This one's going to take a little bit of time, but if you can find a dozen or so titles that are, that are valuable in your area, look at the publishers for those titles. Also, if you can get a narrow call number range that works for you, go look at worldcat.org, which is free, Search that one and go through and look at the publishers that way. Um, I would suggest that you search by, that, by both the subject and a time limitation so you can limit it down to recent things. And finally, do that thing that we all tell students not to do. Cheat. Find a major library 
in the same that collects in the same area you do. For business, it might be the um, Harvard has a business library that's used a lot. For, I've also seen vet med librarians use other vet med libraries, and go look in their catalogs to see what publishers they're buying from. Or, like I said, use your professional resources. Ask your colleagues who are the major publishers you use. Somebody will answer you. When I started collecting, ah, interesting question. When you started collecting in engineering, did you have a background in calculus? Or, hmm. When I started collecting in engineering, I did not have a background in calculus. I took the minimum math requirement required to get my math bachelor's degree, and calculus was not in that. It was probability and statistics. Um, I also did not have background in science. I took the minimum science requirements to get my bachelor's degree. I did have a class in library school in science and technology reference librarianship. We spent one three-hour class period on engineering and engineering resources, and I still didn't know the difference between the different kinds of engineering after that three hours because you just can't learn that much in a three-hour class period. I knew some of the major reference sources. I didn't know the difference between the, the, the different disciplines. Um, and yes, I have selected, and I have even been complimented by a couple of faculty members on how good a job I did selecting. Hmm. Do you have a suggestion on how to find major publishers in a social sciences field? Okay, I think that probably has been answered already. Find a library or a listserv that, um, or a professional association in that social sciences field. Take a look at what kinds of things they're recommending and what kinds of things they're buying. Hmm, and I've got a question that's gotten started. What are your thoughts regarding, but there's no answer to this one. It doesn't finish. Ah, here we go. What are your thoughts regarding collecting resources just in case versus when needed, especially at a small library? If you've got the budget to collect just in case, that's wonderful. Um, I would love to be able to do more of that. Our budget is getting tight, like a lot of people's budgets are. We're doing less and less collecting just in case. I work very hard at trying to buy things that I think are likely to be needed this year. Now, if you're, you know, if I had plenty of money, I would do more just in case collecting. But I can't afford it, and we can't justify it to the people who give us our budget. So. I look at what people are using and what they need. Hmm. Well, it looks like we're about out of time. I'm going to pass this back over to Ellen to close up, but I'd love to hear from anybody who has any other questions. Feel free to email me and ask questions. Thank you, Ginger. Let me be the first to congratulate you on this um, presentation. Um, Ginger has included her email address if you have further questions or want to explore more with her about her collection development experiences. On February 24th, Alexa's, Alexa is providing another um, session similar to this um, on a completely different subject called C Cataloging Icky Things by Pamela Newberg at 2 p.m. on February 24th. Um, Pamela is an assistant professor at the University of Northern Colorado. So if that's appealing to you, I hope you'll sign up. Um, we appreciate all of you attending today, and thank you very much for your attention.